Welcome back to Al's Geek Lab. I hope you're doing fantastic. Today, I'm not taking you back to the 70s. I'm not taking you back to the 80s even. You're going, what? Surely not later than the 80s. Ah, yes. I'm taking you back to the 90s. Look at this brick. You know, this is the time when the 56K modems were taking us onto the internet, screaming as they were, lots of noise and confusion. And it was a time when Microsoft were making lots of blue screens of death. And well, Apple were just kind of trying to be Apple and, well, stay alive, I think. Anyway, we're going to review this. It's the PowerBook. Power. I think I see what you did there, Apple, because they had the Power PC. Anyway, this is the Apple PowerBook 1400C, and I think that C stood for color. So I'm going to switch this bad boy on and let you know whether it's good or bad. That's all coming up here on Al's Geek Lab. Stay tuned. This PowerBook 1400C launched in 1996 and lasted 18 months on the market. This laptop was kindly donated to the channel by Jeff McClellan. It is in near mint condition for its age, so thank you so much, Jeff. It's been great fun to play with this little laptop. Or should that be chunky laptop? Anyway, the 1400C was a mid-range business laptop, meaning that it was designed for serious people doing serious things like writing documents in Clarisworks or playing SimCity 2000 instead of actually working. Anyway, under the hood, it came with a mighty PowerPC 603 processor running at speeds of, wait for it, 117 megahertz. Or if you really went and splurged out, the later model it came in at an absolutely whopping 133 megahertz. Absolute lightning back in the day. If you had the 133 megahertz model, you were basically a tech god, okay? Right, now, RAM. How much memory did this thing have? Brace yourself, because this beast shipped with 12 megabytes of integrated RAM, and if you were feeling fancy, you could upgrade it to a ridiculous 64 megabytes. That's right, an entire 64 megabytes of raw, untamed power. Imagine all the solitaire that you could run. Storage-wise, we got 750 megabytes or a one gigabyte hard drive, small enough to fit on a modern USB stick, but large enough back then to hold your life's work, a collection of questionable MIDI files and about four high quality JPEGs. So what's it called the 1400C for? Was it because Apple liked numbers? Was it because it had some kind of secret code? Nope. The 1400 referred to a weird internal naming scheme that Apple had for its power books, and the C stood for something quite special because C meant color. That's right, this model had a brilliant full color 11.3 inch TFT, that's thin film transistor, active matrix display, whilst the poorer folks, well, they got stuck with the 1400 CS, which had a passive matrix display, meaning everything looked like it was covered in Vaseline. Now let's talk about the software. This machine is running macOS 8.6, which was released in 1999, meaning this laptop was stretching its legs a bit by then, so it's been probably upgraded. But anyway, it was still holding its own running macOS 8.6, as I've seen here, I guess. It's a little bit slow on startup, but once it gets going, it's, it's all right. Now, the good in 8.6, it's introduced the platinum theme, so finally Max looked kinda sleek instead of looking like something you'd find at a dentist's office. It also had multi-threading. Well, kinda. macOS 8 introduced things that allowed you to do two things at once in a properly kind of cooperative way. That meant that in actual reality, things could now crash separately instead of the whole system taking a nosedive. And it also supported modern-ish internet. That means that you could browse the web in full glorious color if you had the patience of a saint and a dial-up connection that didn't cut out when someone picked up the phone. All of the above did actually apply. The bad about macOS 8 is that it wasn't proper protected memory. 
So yes, if one app crashed, everything crashed. It was like dominoes, but less fun. And let's not forget, it had those little bomb icons when things went wrong, as if to say, congratulations, you've destroyed your work in spectacular fashion. Compared to Mac OS 7, it was more modern, it was sleeker, and it was a bit more stable. Compared to Mac OS 9, it was already feeling dated because Mac OS 9 was like, right, let's fix everything that was broken before. This video is sponsored by the very wonderful people at PCBWay. PCBWay are the leading electronics and prototyping manufacturer. If you've got an idea, you can use PCBWay to turn it into a reality. PCBWay can build PCBs from just $5 and build them for you in around 24 hours. You can upload your PCB file and have PCBWay assemble it all for you. PCBWay also do 3D printing, CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, injection molding and so much more. So if you've got an idea for an electronics project, why don't you give PCBWay a try at PCBWay.com. After all, that is the PCBWay. We thank PCBWay for sponsoring Al's Geek Lab. Now, let's get back to the video. An important thing about all computers, I don't care whether you're the most serious business person or not on the planet, you still need to know about whether it can run Doom. So what was Mac OS 8 and the PowerBook 1400C actually like when it came to running games? Well, Gaming-wise, you could run the absolute classics, Marathon, SimCity 2000, Myst, Civilization, and of course, yes, it was possible to run Doom on it. Because if a microwave can run Doom, then the 1400C can do too. With the right upgrades, you could even get some early 3D games running. Badly. But let's just say if you tried playing Quake, you'd be seeing more frames in your local art gallery than on your screen. In terms of upgrades, it was possible to make it go even faster. Now, if you were a tech wizard in the 1990s, or just someone with far too much money, upgrading this beast was possible. First, you could upgrade the RAM to a jaw-dropping 64 megabytes. You would be the envy of every nerd in your computing class if you had that. Secondly, you could swap in a bigger hard drive. Some Brave Souls even threw compact flash adapters in there to make it faster. And I believe it is possible to get an SSD in there of some description with a proper adapter. Uh, third, the modular CD-ROM drive bay let you swap out the CD drive for a floppy drive like this. Perfect for anyone who enjoys ancient technology and suffering. And if you were the baller, you could even add a G3 processor upgrade, turning this into an absolute monster for around 1998. But the final thoughts on this machine, is it still worth using? No, definitely not in 2025. Should you own one? If you love retro tech, if you appreciate a laptop that looks like it could survive a small explosion, and if you want a piece of 90s Apple history, then this is an absolute gem of a machine. Just don't expect it to replace your M4 MacBook Pro anytime soon, unless your MacBook Pro explodes, that is, and you need something to club a mugger with, then this thing might just save your life. Well, that's all for today, folks. I hope you've enjoyed this nostalgic trip back into the 1990s. Make sure to like the channel, of course, subscribe, and of course, leave a comment, especially if you ever used a PowerBook back in the day. What did you use it for? Did you experience the joy of losing an essay to a random system crash? Do let me know. Until next time, take care, and may your Mac never show you the bomb icon. Ta-da!